Welcome to the Vine Podcast. This is Warren, and I guess I should say welcome back to the Vine Podcast. It has been a while since we've recorded an episode like this. We had some Advent readings during the month of December, and know that many participated in that and have said that they enjoyed that, but we haven't recorded one of these episodes in a while, and so we are back today to record our first episode of the new year. And so joining me today again are some usual participants with me in these episodes. Jason and Rachel are here with me today. Good morning, Jason and Rachel. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Happy to see y'all again. Yes, good to see both of you. I'm glad glad we're back for some conversation today. And so we've got today a nice, uh, very narrow topic for today, the Bible. Not broad at all. <laughs> easy to easy to dig into. Uh, well, it is, is easy to dig into because there are many different ways we could go in conversation. As I, I mentioned in the sermon yesterday on, on January 23rd, that there's a, another podcast that I listen to <clears throat> that is almost 200 episodes that are either directly stemming from or inspired by that question of what is the Bible. And so there's all there's there's just countless ways we could go in discussion in in ways of discussion about that today. But to give a little bit of a setup, we're going to talk about the Bible today because on Sunday mornings currently at the Vine, we are exploring four guides or guiding principles that we believe guide us and 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 sort of direct us shape us as a church body. These are concepts that shape our practices that help to inform who we are. And so today uh, or or Sunday I should say, we we touched on one of those guiding principles which is scripture or the Bible. And so today we're going to expand on that conversation that is as I said, there's just countless ways we could go in thinking about that. But the way that I'm kind of thinking about this this discussion today is as kind of a a conversational extension of the sermon. And so that's kind of where we're going to pick up. So if you haven't listened to the sermon yet from Sunday, from January 23rd, 2022, you you might want to start there. That might be a helpful precursor to this conversation, or it may may not. This one may end up standing out, standing alone fine on its own. We'll see how it ends up. But we'll kind of start there with that being kind of the jumping off point for conversation. And so with that, Jason or, or Rachel, I'd like to just kind of throw it open to one of you to see if you have a place that you'd like us to start or a, a comment, a direction, a, a pushback, a spark or whatever that you might have had from, from the sermon or from any of our conversations about kind of scripture so far. And we'll start there and see where we go. Scripture is one of those things that I think uh, a lot of times we will mention as important or as kind of the the guiding uh, part of our life. But I think that all too often our conversations are a little overly simplistic about it. Um, Warren, you touched on some of this uh, yesterday in the sermon, but a lot of it, a lot of the, um, a lot of the challenge and difficulty with scripture is that it uses human language to communicate something. And human language is very much open to interpretation. There are abstract concepts. There are, um, there, there are contexts that we individually bring and collectively bring to our interpretation of scripture. And it's unavoidable to bring those dynamics to how we read and understand scripture. And I'm not saying that that's a, that's not a bad thing. I think that that's inherently part of it. Um, but I think that's an aspect that we often neglect and, and don't, um, recognize as being part of our, um, you know, part of our interpretive hermeneutic. And so when we approach scripture, I think one of the first things that we have to to do is approach it with a lot of humility. Um, not just humility in you know in the presence of something as powerful and as um, you know so heavy as some of the scripture can be, 
but also humility in the sense that my way of reading it and interpreting it um, is very particular to me and I need to be careful how much I impose that upon other people and how much I presuppose um, my interpretation is the quote-unquote right or or superior interpretation and that's not to say that there aren't bad ways to interpret scripture there certainly are but in approaching scripture with humility um, I think it recognizes that there are limitations to my interpretation and in the way that I read scripture no matter how I choose to do it, just because there are limitations to my own understanding, there are limitations to my um, perspective and context. So I think humility is is one of those um, uh, humility is one of those aspects of reading scripture that um, I, I hold very in very high regard. Yeah, there there are bad ways to interpret scripture, and and the bad ways are the ways that are not my way. Is that the point you were making, or is that yeah. the opposite? I think that's the opposite point of what you were making. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but we can think right. that way sometimes, yeah. yeah. I think one of the most helpful things for me in growing in my understanding of Scripture is seeing each individual section or story or book as part of a grand narrative or a meta-narrative of Scripture and seeing how um, these things fit together and... Um, Placing the stories on somewhat of a timeline or an arch or even a picture is something that I've done and that I've taught. Um, charting kind of major events of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so whenever you come to a passage of scripture asking, where does this fit within the, the grand context, the greater story, the redemption story? Um, and I think that type of contextual reading, bigger contextual reading, Help us helps us to see the greater themes like the redemption of God or the presence of God dwelling with his people, uh, the promises and the faithfulness of God or justice and freedom, compassion. These kinds of themes we can see weaving throughout the whole story and so how one little part connects to other parts of scripture. That's been helpful to me and helpful to the people that I've taught. Yeah, that's good. And I think you know, one of the things that I kind of wanted to, to touch on today that I think fits in well with that will actually perhaps sound like I'm pushing against it at first, but it'll it'll work back around to it. So, but because one of the, the shifts that has been, I think, the most influential for me personally, as I kind of think about and envision the Bible is this this shift from thinking about the Bible as kind of one book to to envisioning it more as a library or collection of of works. And I think I originally had this this vision of the Bible as kind of one book that was put together for the purpose of of being one book. And I think then once you learn about kind of how the Bible was put together and how it was curated basically and these letters and and books and writings were kind of put together in this one this one work that that we now call the Bible that has been helpful for me in a lot of ways and i think it it alleviates in some ways some of the questions and issues that come from either consciously or unconsciously just kind of viewing it as one book so for instance i think if you view it as a library of works it's it's much easier for me at least to accept that there are different types of of literature in scripture that that if you go to a library, you would expect there to be different types of literature, but that that's harder to envision sometimes just with kind of one book. Um, I think it's also easier that way to allow for there to be differences or what some people would see as contradictions kind of as you go through it, that if you if you keep in mind that this is this is a collection of documents that are written over probably like 1300 years by various authors in different places, um, yeah, it, it makes sense that some things are going to be presented a little differently. And then lastly, I think with that in mind and keeping in mind that it's written in different places by different authors over more than a thousand years, I think it makes it even more impressive. This is where it'll come back to the point that that I think you were kind of making, Rachel, the, and where I said there is a connection in my mind. 
I think it makes it even more impressive that there are cohesive themes and threads and concepts that are developed over the course of the Bible that you can pick out, that you can point to, that that the authors call back to, that they seem to be referencing over and over again, that there are these threads that, that you can follow throughout the narrative of Scripture. And I, th- I think the, vac- the fact that you can do that over a diverse collection of documents is just is incredible when you consider the scope and time frame that they were written in and and just all the different aspects of it. I think it to me it adds to that and adds to the the inspiration if you want to call it that that you can see these threads developed over such a a diverse collection of writings. Yeah, and with the story part, I think of it also as a story of a people. It's a people group and they're writing their story. And so these are the the parts of their story that were significant to them that they told orally and have recorded for us and put together and that were collected over time and all of that. And so that's part of it being a unified story to me is that it's the story of a people group um, that continues to speak to us, even though we weren't part of that people group. Yeah, I think the... uh... The idea of a collection or library of books as opposed to one singular book um, is good is is a good way to think of it um, and it's not to say that those books don't relate to each other a lot of times you will have a library that um, that are very much connected in some way um, and I think when it comes to the Bible I, th- I think the connection is uh, you know the the love of God and His people that there that seems to be the through line through the ups and downs. Um, you know, you start with Genesis, and um, which is very much a theological book, and you move to something like uh, Leviticus, which by definition is is somewhat of a law book um, with some history in it. Um, and Chronicles, which is very historical, and then you get into the New Testament with you know the letters of uh, of Paul and and uh, the the letters of the that make up a good portion of the New Testament. And then you have something completely out in left field in the Book of Revelation, and individually they um, sorry, hold on a second. Um, individually, they are very different and very diverse and bring very different tones and very different emphasis to the reader. Um, but they are all connected to God and God's identity and God's love and, uh, God's will for our lives in one way or another. And I think it, it helps to, basically not have to feel like I have the same expectations of all the different books of the Bible or that they are trying to, to accomplish the same thing, so to speak, that I can, I can approach Matthew, you know, and the gospels differently than Job, for instance, without having to reconcile kind of, you know, and fit them into the same box. And, and even Psalms, that if you read through Psalms, like if you read through Psalms, I, th- I think you can make a pretty good case that in some Psalms, there's just some bad theology or at least some lamenting to God in ways that we would say, uh, that's probably not the, the best use of, of language that I think, I think that was something that even we talked about with David Knipe in an episode, like wishing for babies to be dashed against the rocks probably isn't something that you would want to do a sermon about or consider good theology, <laughs> but it's lament and it's, 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 it's recognizing something about the human experience and, and crying out to God and where we find ourselves in despair. And so there's use for it, but it's not something that I would want to take and say, this is what I'm going to model in my life. Like we might with, with other parts of the Bible. And so I think, I think it's helpful in, in kind of our approach to it, to remember those things. Well, and, to your point, uh, when you read about those parts of the Bible, um, that's where you have to ask yourself, okay, how does this connect to the broader narrative? How does this connect to, um, to, you know, God's identity and God's love for us? And a lot of times it's because, 
uh, exactly because of that, that human suffering has a universal quality to it. And, uh, and, and we're, we do well, not only to kind of forgive ourselves for our own human, you know, human emotions that may feel overwhelming, but also take that into consideration when dealing with other people, that other people may struggle with those same human emotions. And if a man after God's own heart and King David can, uh, can have such horrific thoughts and feelings, um, then, you know, we, our, our response to that may not necessarily be, you know, ostracizing him or chastising him, uh, necessarily, but compassion and, and understanding and empathy that that may be a better way to follow. Um, not to say that what's being discussed there is, uh, is okay or good theology, as you say, but it's, but in my mind, I read that not so much as a statement about theology, but as a statement of, of pain and suffering and, uh, something that I think God feels and, and recognizes in us, but that we should feel and recognize in other people as well. No, I agree. I agree. And that's why I say I think sometimes, especially when we read about kind of heroes of faith in the Old Testament, so to speak, we want to like fit everything into like there is I should there there are moral lessons that I should learn from this and apply to my life. You know what I mean? That if we try and we try to fit all of scripture into that, then we struggle with with something like that. That, yeah, all of Psalms isn't supposed to be good theology that that's that that should be something I'm trying to emulate in, in good practices, but that it does represent pain and suffering. And, and yeah, so I agree. One tool I think that's helpful in that conversation is determining if a certain scripture is descriptive or prescriptive. So descriptive, it's simply describing what happened or what someone did. And prescriptive is this is the prescription of what you should also do. And so much of the Bible is descriptive, like talking about Abraham's story. We could assume that that since he is a patriarch of the faith, we should model our lives after him and do everything that he did. But he was a flawed human being. And so a lot of what scripture tells us about his story is just simply telling us that he did it, not that we also should as well. Um, and so all of the people in the Bible are, are human beings that walked with God in a flawed way. And so we have to kind of use discernment and the Holy Spirit and community to help us determine what are places where I'm modeling after this person and what are places where I see that this was a mistake or a lack of faithfulness or obedience in God. And it's part of that person's story. Mm, that's good. That's a good clarification. And, and distinction, I think. And I think then, like you said, it, it takes discernment and even um, we could we could still come to different thoughts about some of that. Like, for instance, I'm thinking you mentioned Abraham's story and I have sort of thought and preached and taught for a long time that Abraham, Abraham's... Um, lying about Sarah, basically, that saying, because there's two different times where Abraham says about Sarah that she's, she's his sister, basically to save his own life. And he's afraid he's going to get killed when they go into these foreign com- countries. So he says, tell everybody you're my sister. And it has always seemed selfish to me that he did that and like a mistake and, you know, on and on we could go. But I've read recently even rabbinical kind of thoughts and teachings that will kind of compliment him for that and say, actually, it's pretty strategic and shrewd. And it, it was it was the best option he had available for him, not only for his safety, but also for Sarah's. And and that there's kind of a case to be made on that on that side of things as well that I don't think I had really ever, or at least in, in kind of adulthood, or as I'd come to think about that story more critically considered. And so it does take discernment, and it does take working out. And, and I think to go to some of what I had mentioned in the sermon, that may our views of that may change over the course of our lives. And as we interact with other people who are encountering scripture differently, our thoughts and opinions may change. And and that's okay. Maybe I'll preach that sermon differently five years from now than I would have, you know, two years ago. And that's that's part of the journey of faith. Mm. 
One of my favorite videos from the Bible Project is the Jewish meditation literature video where they talk about how our relationship with scripture is supposed to be this lifelong meditation of something that you, the more time you spend in it over your lifetime, the more that you're able to connect stories and see themes and understand the narrative in ways that you don't as a teenager and you don't as a young adult, but you do more as you grow older. Um, and so it's an encouragement of if you feel like the Bible is really confusing, like don't give up because um, the more time that you spend in it, the more that you come to like understand and the significance in it in your life increases. So I would recommend that video in there's podcasts and stuff from the Bible Project on Jewish meditation literature and how it's kind of it's supposed to be this lifelong journey and contemplation in which we grow and we understand God um, more and maybe in phases over the course of our, our life and our walk with him. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Jason, you made a comment earlier that I want to come back to. You said our conversations about the Bible are, are sometimes overly simplistic. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about that. What do you, what do you, what do you kind of envision by that, and why do you think that is? Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, the over simplistic nature is kind of epitomized by, you know, the good old. I don't, I don't know if they have this in other denominations. I suspect perhaps they do, but that good old saying that I used to hear in Church of Christ a lot. You know, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Or something to that effect um, where if I can find a scripture you know that says XYZ whatever XYZ is then I'm gonna take that at face value and I'm gonna believe exactly what it says and that's gonna be my my rule well the problem with that is there's so much information in the Bible there's so much context to uh, to, to the writing of the Bible and the presumed reading of the Bible, uh, the different books, I should say, that that to me robs the Bible and robs scripture of, you know, it, it, it is complex to live in the world. Our lives are not simple. Um, and the decisions, the choices, the priorities that we have to make every day are not always simple. And so why would we think that that God's scripture, which frankly, I don't think I will ever fully understand everything that I read in scripture. I think I will, you know, go to my deathbed uh, still having questions and confusing parts. I just have accepted that as my fate. <laughs> And so I don't know why we would assume that if I simply read something that I could take it at face value, take everything at face value and, and I will be fully informed into what that scripture is meaning to tell me. Um, I think, first of all, that places a lot of responsibility on my own uh, strategies of interpretation and again, that kind of goes back to my my original point about humility. And uh, if if I have a if I have humility in how I read scripture, then I'm not going to lean only on my own understanding of scripture, but I'm going to uh, you know recognize that my understanding, my interpretation is limited to kind of my own way of understanding myself and my world and how I just interpret my own life. Um, and so I think the mistake that we often make in oversimplifying scripture is that we want it to be uh, very black and white when life has a lot of gray in it. And so therefore scripture, I believe, has a lot of gray in it. We want it to be not very much work. We want it to be easy. And scripture is not easy. I mean, for one thing, there's a lot of words in there. If scripture was easy, then it would just be a pamphlet. You know, we wouldn't need all these different books of the Bible. Um, and we wouldn't and so, have so many different views of it. Right, exactly. 
we wouldn't yeah. have. I don't know. I've, I've thought about, I haven't done, gone and done this yet, but I've thought about, as we've kind of been talking about some of these topics, I've thought about going to look up how many churches there are in Temple. I don't know how many there are, but it's got to be a lot. And if, if, uh, if it were easy to kind of interpret all of this, we would have far less churches, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and so my um, my statement about it being that we oversimplify it really boils down to that is is that I want something to be simple. I want it to be easy and I want it to be straightforward and very black and white. And if that's what I want, then I can close my eyes to the parts that aren't that. And then I can, you know, take that line about, you know, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. And, and just call it a day. Um, but I'm probably getting something, I'm probably making some mistakes in there. And I'm probably missing some pretty important points. And I may not necessarily even be um, doing all I can to fulfill God's will in my life. I agree. That's good. Something you said in there made me think of a show that I know you and I both enjoy or enjoyed, Jason. Uh, The Good Place. Weren't you a fan of The Good Place, Jason? Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, Michael Schur, who um, was the creator of The Good Place... Yeah. Recently wrote a book of philosophy about his lessons learned making that show, which um, actually I think comes out tomorrow. I think it comes out um, because I have it (laughs) pre-ordered. I forgot that that was a Michael Schur show. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like a baseball complete nerd. Did you know that, Jason? Oh, yeah. Actually, it was a baseball podcast that I listened to that he was on. He was a guest on this baseball podcast. It's a little little side note for for us, but but one of the things that I loved about the Good Place, if you haven't seen the Good Place, I recommend it. You can't um, you can't go into it thinking that it's necessarily making a point about the afterlife. Like that's not the point. It's not a theological uh, exploration of of the afterlife per se. But it is a very, I think it is a very philosophical, and I think you could say theological exploration of just humanity. And what what makes a good person, and what what do, what do our relationships mean and lead us towards, and plenty of good lessons in it. But one of the things that I thought they did a really good job of of exploring in a creative way was just some of what you were saying there about the difficulties of life and of making good decisions and of kind of living living well in the modern world and how complicated that can be. And basically this idea, kind of what they come to is that the only way you can do that without making any mistakes is to basically live as a hermit completely disconnected from everyone else. And um, they have a character in the show that tries to that. do just that and he's miserable. He's miserable, he's right. absolutely miserable. And so there's a lot of interesting <laughs> points they make that I'll, I'll try not to to spoil too much of it of how they get there if you haven't seen it and want to go back and watch it. But, but yeah, even, even to the point of like, you know, someone said, well, like a a bad thing that someone did was I think something like buying tomatoes in the grocery store. It's like, well, that's just buying tomatoes. It's like, well, but these tomatoes, the growing of these tomatoes were exploiting these farmers. And, you know, then you, once you just go on the list in, in kind of this global society, um, it's like, man, making the best decision in every situation is, is, is impossible unless you're just completely disconnected from everyone else. But I think that's where humility comes into it and grace and, and this, this idea of working it out um, over our lives, kind of as Rachel was saying, as we, as we stay engaged with Scripture over the course of our lives and, and recognizing that, that I'm, I'm going to have to do that with humility and with knowing that, that it may take some adjustments along the way. But and I think all that kind of leads into where we'll go next week with having an appreciation for and a trust in God's grace as I attempt to to going about doing that. And I think humility is is a big part of that. Uh, well, I mentioned I, w- I want to come to to just some kind of thoughts, maybe about metaphors of Scripture, because we we may have kind of talked around this a little bit today. But I mentioned in the sermon yesterday that I kind of have this working metaphor of Scripture as a as a script, which even that I briefly mentioned in, in there that, that, that even, even kind of how you think about that would depend on kind of your definition of script. Cause some people I know view that as very, um, 
as if it's giving you kind of what it's I was basically prescriptive. that it is prescriptive. Yeah. In, in a way yeah. that I wasn't necessarily thinking of script. Uh, and so I mentioned that in the sermon, I'm wondering, do, do either of you kind of have a working metaphor that, that we haven't touched on yet that you kind of envision scripture as? Well, before I answer that question, I would like to, if I may make a comment about the metaphor of script, uh, for scripture. And that is that, it if you think about a script most people think of a script as like you said prescriptive that this is what you're supposed to do and the script tells you exactly what to do and what to say but anyone who has been in a movie or a tv show or on a or on stage in a play knows that that's not at all what the script does The script gives you the lines. It does give you some things to say, and some things are are very key and important. It doesn't give, and it may give some amount of stage direction, but it doesn't give everything. It doesn't describe everything. This is why you can go see two different productions of the exact same play, and you recognize it as being the same play, but it looks very different. From the set design to the direction to um, you know different choices that the that the actors make and even interpretation of the characters can be extremely different and they're working from the exact same script and sometimes it even helps to uh, to to think about okay what isn't being said here and a lot of scripts are you know intentionally don't prescribe everything because to be that prescriptive would take out a lot of the uh, uniqueness and the humanity of the production that it would start to feel very mechanical and i think that in many ways relates to you know when when talking about theology and scripture and that sort of thing i think that part of what makes our faith in God and our relationship with God so personal is that it is a choice that we come to, that it's something that we eventually um, decide that that God is um, God is the guide in my life and God is the central force in my life and I'm going to make decisions and live my life for His will. You know, at some point, all of us who uh, who are Christians make that decision. And if it was purely prescriptive, it would be fairly mechanical and robotic. And I don't know that that would be much of a choice. You know, God wants our heart and you can't really give your heart to God if you don't really have a choice. And, and, and so it would be very prescriptive. And so I think a lot of the script, as it were, is intentionally left unknowable or ambiguous, because I think that that's an important part of our decision to follow God, and and it's part, an important part of our faith, uh, as opposed to, you know, fact. You know, fact and faith doesn't mean that faith is wrong if something is is faithful but not factual. It just means that there's a a leap there. There's a belief that is part of that that isn't necessarily provable or isn't you know objective in a sense and i think that's an important part of faith and i think that that's an important part of the way that scripture is constructed as well yeah i'm, I'm glad you said that cuz i was wondering about what just what thoughts you would have on that idea of scripture as a as a script as someone who has a theater background so i appreciate that perspective and and i think rachel i'd, I'd be curious to hear from you because i think part of what that assumes is that the playing out of that script is going to look different, for instance, in Temple, Texas, than it would in Kenya, for instance. And so I'm curious to hear, Rachel, if you just have a a perspective or thought on that of, of, are there ways that you have seen that kind of play out culturally different across different um, cultures? (laughs) Well, when I heard you quote Bergamon on scripture being a script, I interpreted it more as it's something to be lived out, something to be enacted in our lives, that we are part of the story. Because I think 
one of the beautiful things about the Bible is that it invites us into the story. It provides an invitation for us to belong to this narrative, for the narrative to belong to us and for us to be people in it, characters in it, living it out. So I think, yes, it is interpreted or or used differently across different cultures and times and places. But the way I interpret Brueggemann's words is that we get to be part of this. It's not just a book like another novel or, you know, something else that you would read and you would say, wow, that's a cool story. And then you're done with the book. And then you might think of it a few more times in your life, but it's not your life. But what's unique about scripture for those of us who believe in Jesus is that we are invited to become part of the story and we continue the story. So not in a, you know, egotistical way, but when I read scripture, I see myself in it. Um, Not that I am those characters, but I might see ways in which their failures remind me of my own. Um, or God's grace to them reveals to me how God is being present to me in the moment. Or when I'm sharing the gospel, I'm being part of, of the, the prophets that the apostles who Jesus told to go out and to share his message. And so to me, that's what, that's what I get from Brueggemann's words, um, that we are part of this. We get to live it out. Not that it's necessarily, these are the specific lines you have to say and where you're going to stand but it's a living story and you get to join in it. Yeah, I think that's true. And I I do think, I think part of what he he went on to say in the conversation where that came from is that that's going to look different in different places and circumstances. Um, And that it is something that is to be enacted and lived out. And because of that, it's going to take on, take on different shape and form across different cultures, societies, times, um, and that that is not only okay, but that that is by design is, is I think, um, the, the context of, of where he would, he would go with that and, and kind of what he was, was, what he was getting at. Yeah. But, but yeah, I agree that it is something that we are, we are called to, to be a part of for sure. How about other going going back to the idea of other images? Do y'all have other images that you kind of work with or see in in, in scripture? Um, I think of a lot of it like um, like an art gallery in many ways. Um, that there is, you know, if you think about going into an art gallery, any art gallery that is somewhat non-specific to the kind of art that they have there may be a wide variety of art and some of that art may be pretty straightforward you're like okay this is a fairly realistic still life portrait of a bowl of fruit and then others other art pieces of art may be amazing and incredible but you're like i have no idea what i'm looking at you know and then some of it may not even look like art at all. You know, somebody may look at a, a, a Mark Rothko painting and just be thinking, okay, it's, you know, some red stripes on a darker red canvas. What's the big deal? How is this art? And it and some art speaks to you very profoundly and other art just confounds or maybe even angers you. And so you look at that art and if you just kind of glance at it, if you just kind of look at it and go, okay, that's nice, or I like that, or I don't like that, um, there's probably a lot of depth that you may be missing. Um, one thing that I've learned, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an artist by any means, um, but I do enjoy going to art galleries and, and looking at art and learning from, from artwork. And one thing I've learned is that Art, benef- you benefit from the art the more you study it and the more you observe it and the more you are able to empty your mind and just let it wash over you and inform you. Um, and so, like, there there are some... We, we have a little bit of artwork in our house, not much, but there's a, a couple of paintings that we've had my wife and I've had for years, maybe even decades. Um, 
and I can still look at those pieces of art and get something new out of it. And I still look at, I mean, nothing about the art has changed. It's exactly, it looks exactly the same as it did when we first got it, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Um, But I can look at it today and, and it affects me differently. Part of that is my own different place of where I am in life. Um, And part of it is that it's nuanced and it's detailed and I'm not going to pick up on all those nuances and details all at once. And I think scripture is is a lot like that in that I can read a passage um, at, you know, age 21 or 22 and it's going to affect me in a particular way. And then I read it again at 44 or 45 and it's going to affect me very differently. And that's not to say that the way it's affecting me at 44 or 45 is better or more mature or preferred because I am, you know, more than two decades older. It's just different uh, because of where I am in my life and what I need to hear and what I need to uh, to get from it. By the same token, if I just read a scripture and feel like, okay, I've read that passage, I'm done with it then there's probably a lot of nuance, a lot of detail, and a lot of meaning that I'm missing. And I need to come back to it. That's why coming back to the same scripture is so beneficial. You know, there's some passages of scripture that I've heard over and over again my entire life, you know, probably hundreds of times in, you know, various Bible studies, sermons, personal Bible readings, what have you. Um, But I'll hear it in a particular context, in a particular moment, or maybe delivered in a particular way, and it affects me very differently. And so I think because of the diversity of literature that's in the Bible and because of the way that it is nuanced and the way that it will affect you in different ways at different times in your life, um, I do think of scripture kind of like that massive art gallery you know, something like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which has so much diversity of art and, you know, every, you know, everything from the most realistic portrait to, you know, pencil drawings to surrealism to complete most weird Jackson Pollock-esque abstracts. Um, and they all can affect you differently and they all have something to say. I like that. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think art is is a good analogy for scripture. The Bible Project also, they talk about a symphony and that there's different movements and pieces and parts to the symphony. And if you're someone who is not experienced or hasn't studied music, you can listen to the song and still appreciate it and say that's beautiful. But if you've lived with it for a long time or you've studied music, you can hear all the contours and the harmonies and the disharmony and how it changes pace and all the staccatos and you appreciate all those things more and it might mean more to you. Um, So yeah, I think we're grasping for language to describe something that in a way is almost indescribable. Um, So art language does help, but a lot of the metaphors I come to are the ones that are given to us by scripture itself. So Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So God's word lights us. It shows us the way that we should go and it's right there in front of us, but it also helps us to know the longer journey ahead and Jesus tells parables about a seed. Um, I see the word of God being parallel to the seed. What kind of soil is our life going to be? How will we receive that seed? Will we let it grow? Will we um, fertilize it and you know make sure that it has what it needs to flourish in our lives? Or will we um, just kind of not care for that seed or refuse it or be bad soil or whatever it may be? Um, one that, that I think is important practically is from Hebrews uh, 4, 12, and 13. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So you have this sharpness. Uh, it's a double-edged sword or sharper than that but 
it's like a scalpel. <laughs> Scripture is like a surgical tool that can cut t- to you and divide things that belong versus the things that don't belong. It can remove the cancerous tumor from your heart or the disease that's affecting you, that's harming your life. It can reveal to you your own failings, your own sin, your own pride, and cuts in and separates and removes. And so that one to me reminds me of the authority and the power of God's word to actually change our lives if we will let it do the work that it that it has the power to do. Yeah, that's good. And I think part of why to me it's helpful to think through kind of what what images, what metaphors uh, do we have for scripture? I think part of why that's helpful for me is that we do have to sort of have a a lens through which we are approaching scripture. And and sometimes that lens changes and sometimes that, that perspective changes or the metaphor changes over time. And I think especially, you know, we're, we're thinking about it in the context of this sermon series and in the context that we're talking about it here is something that guides us as as a church and as individuals. And I think it is helpful in that context to kind of examine what is what is the lens, what's the perspective that we're kind of funneling this through or viewing it through. And I think Jason even spoke to that at the end of Sunday about this this idea of, of it hopefully being something that 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 brings us toward uh, loving God and, and loving others. And and you know, for me, I do think it's everything in scriptures is something I didn't necessarily mention in the sermon. I don't think at least directly that, that I do think scripture, the entirety of scripture is, is pointing to Jesus in some way Um, that the old Testament is, it's not known in the old Testament times, but looking back on it, it's leading to Christ and everything after Christ is kind of a reflection on, on what the world and what life and what faith are like um, now that he has come and and so that's helpful for me personally in kind of um, funneling funneling everything through the message, the life, the teachings, the resurrection of Jesus, and and kind of going out from there in in the exploration of of scripture and application of scripture and everything else that that we would kind of think of in terms of study and applying it and whatever else we might do with it. That reminds me of one of my favorite stories, Luke twenty four when Jesus is walking with the people after his resurrection who try to explain to him what happens. And then they realize um, later that he was Jesus. But Luke 24 verse 27 says, This is Jesus beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he went back and talked to them about Moses and the law and the prophets and the Psalms and all those places about how those were actually talking about Jesus, (laughs) the Messiah. How cool would that have been to be there and to have heard that explanation from Jesus? Yeah, and you know that that's that is that's a great story, and I think it's it's another example almost of what Jason was talking about earlier that it would be. it would be nice to have like the notes, like it would be nice to have Jesus's handout from that conversation. Like here, here, here is, here is specifically everything from Moses and the prophets that was, that is connected to me. And, and, you know, it would be nice to have a podcast of that conversation that he had, but we don't have that. Um, And I think that's part of the point. Like we don't have all of those pieces that are are spoken to in scripture or are hinted at its its scripture and so there is an exploration factor that that has to happen with that and i think that's one of the places that i've come to again that'll kind of lead us to next week is that um i don't think there's an expectation that i'm supposed to have all the right answers because i don't think it's possible and i don't think it's the point and, but I think we feel like that sometimes that man if i get if I get one of these things wrong what's gonna what's gonna happen and I think that is more of a fear based approach than a than a grace based approach because I think if I was supposed to have all the right answers, I think the Bible would look differently I think it also neglects or it also assumes that God 
values and judges the same way that we do. And I don't think that's the case. You know, we, we look to, uh, you know, we, or we want to, we, we are drawn towards objective rubrics of, you know, does it fall in this category or that category? And we want the black and white answer. And if there's gray, we want very distinct shades of gray that I can parse and that I can objectively say where it goes and how it fits. And if, and, and because we live in a society where, uh, that highly values, you know, justice and individual freedoms, we don't like the idea of not being in control of our own destiny. And we don't like the idea of this, this idea that, um, you know, that, that gods may choose to forgive people who, uh, we don't want him to forgive. We don't want to think, you know, we're more like Jonah probably than we care to admit. Um, and so because of that, we're, we want to live our life and, and get everything right and live by the rules and be rewarded for it. But part of our reward, I think, sometimes is, uh, you know, this feeling of self-righteous superiority, <laughs> frankly. Um, and I think that's that's sinful, but very tempting and uh, problematic in many, in many ways. And so when we encounter something like scripture that presents a viewpoint that, or that, that presents God as... Um, you know, more nuanced than that and more complicated than that and less, I, I don't want to say less objective, but maybe that is what I'm talking about. Just less objective in our own definition. In some of the ways word, that we would think about objectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that doesn't sit right. It feels, it feels unjust when I think it's, it, it's God's justice. It's a different kind of justice. And so I, with, with all of that kind of in mind, there's one more, uh, I, want, I want to close with one more story from scripture and one more image, kind of um, metaphor imagery that I like to think of when it comes to at least how we engage with scripture. And so this is actually, it's a story from the life of Jacob. And so I didn't include it on Sunday because we I'd, I'd used this story when we went through Jacob's life a while back on Sunday mornings. But there's this story in 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 the life of Jacob where he ends up wrestling with someone. Um, it, it initially says he's wrestling with a man until daybreak. And so I want to read part of this. And then um, th- this is how I'll close. And if, 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 if either of you have thoughts on this, you can throw them in as we close out. But the text says that Rachel was, I mean, Rachel, that was thinking about Rachel and Jacob's story. And so, <laughs> But it starts out with Jacob, not Rachel. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you, um, because you have wrestled with God and with humans and have overcome. And so as you go forward from there, there's this imagery of Jacob leaving that encounter and, and walking with a limp in this place where his, his hip had been touched. And and so you have this imagery then of, of Jacob going forward with this ever-present limp because of this encounter he has had with God, because of this time that he has spent wrestling with God. And that has become helpful imagery for me as I think about a journey of faith and an engagement with Scripture and exploration with Scripture. This idea that to me, a, a deep and abiding and enduring faith is one that walks with a limp. It's one in which our, our lived experiences and our engagement with Scripture work to continually shape us and guide us and form us so that there is something different about us, different about our gait, different about the way that we traverse the earth that is different as we go forward from that. And, and even in his name change there, I think we're reminded that 
the transformation that results from a willingness to struggle and to wrestle and to ask hard questions is, is a transformation that ultimately brings us closer to God. And so I think that has been sort of helpful imagery for me as it relates to, to faith and, and engaging with and wrestling with Scripture. Um, I know that was uh, just kind of thrown in at the end, but e- either of you have thoughts on that, just kind of hearing that story or connecting that to anything else we've talked about as we close out? I think that is a helpful metaphor and reminds us that we should actually be impacted by Scripture. Um And there are ways even in which it wombs us as well, you know. It can reveal to you things about yourself that you don't necessarily like. And so um, I think that's helpful. But he also gets the new name, too. Um, And so I think that there's wounding but also healing that comes from these words of God. And so, yeah, that. That's a cool application. I hadn't thought of it in that way before, which just shows that all of this is worth it. Um, Well, and I do think, I think there's a connection there between your scalpel imagery and this imagery that I hadn't thought of before, that you're right, there is. In both of those, you could almost make like a surgical um, metaphor, that there is in surgery um, the necessity of a wound being created in order to to repair something or renew something or bring about restoration that, that there is a wounding aspect that brings about healing. I like that. Very good. Well, Jason, Rachel, thank y'all for spending some time with me today and, and thinking through this, this topic a little more. Rachel, you want to close us out in prayer today? Let's pray. Lord, we worship you. We thank you for your word that speaks to us, that it is your breath words inspired by you for our wounding and for our healing. Help us to have more understanding as we go through this life and to connect with you through through your words. I pray for each of our members this week that they would have time and make time to engage with your holy words and that it would impact them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.